what I think is fundamentally missing about the approach today is you use the same process for every carrier. And like, that's, you know, there's different processes, right? There's different levels of risk depending on the carrier profile. And so how can we tailor an experience that, you know, say is different for a new entrant who entered, you know, three months ago in the middle of a hot market has never been inspected. That carrier's experience for claiming their digital identity should look different than someone that's got 20 trucks, been in business 30 years, has a massive digital footprint um, and, you know, is very verifiable. You're listening to Freight Famous, presented by Rose Rocket, bringing you the people that make trucking move from behind the scenes into the limelight. Here's your host, Justin Bailey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Freight Famous, a podcast produced by Rose Rocket. New episodes of Freight Famous will be released about twice a month. On this podcast, we talk with guests about how they build, scale, and automate their trucking business. I'm your host, Justin Bailey, co-founder at Rose Rocket. I'm super excited to introduce my guest today, Jordan Graft. Jordan was the CEO of Triumph, the payments network for trucking. He's also a director's circle member of the uh, Transportation Intermediate Association, or the TIA. Uh, His background also includes investment banking, software development, um, and his newest um, endeavor right now is a product called Highway, which we're going to spend some time on, um, and really looking forward to digging into that, and, you know, in terms of We are recording this show in a time when this product is still in stealth, um, but by the time you hear this, you will be uh, um, uh, in some degree of of, of in the wild. So um, yeah, really, really looking forward to having this this sort of sneak peek at at what uh, what Jordan's working on. Jordan, thanks for uh, thanks for being here, my friend. Awesome, Justin. Thanks for having me. It's 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 a pleasure to be here and excited to um, decided to tell everyone a little bit about Highway. Um, I think you know before we before we go into that, uh, you know, as I mentioned off the top before we started recording, I'm I'm really trying to think about you know ways to bring not just you know uh, sort of industry information to to our listener group, but also you know the people behind uh, you know that are that are building these products and these companies. for reasons not just of, of um, look at how great we are in the things that we're doing, but that also we're all human beings and that we're imperfect, actually. And, and you know, to hopefully, again, bring some potential relatability inspiration or something that I, you know, can't think of right now. So I actually want to try something here a little bit. Um, you know, the first time we had met, you mentioned to me that, that your brother... Uh, was also a uh, executive um, in a, in your past life uh, at, at working at Triumph, and, and actually the first thing that I thought was through the lens of a parent was, shoot, that's a pretty that's a that's a pretty proud uh, you know parental situation to have to have you know t- such high achieving at least from a from a from a career perspective, um, sons doing that. I should be interested to know a bit about your background, but almost like where you came from and where your parents came, like, how did, how, how do you make such smart, good kids? I mean, thanks. Yeah, I have, I have a wonderful father and mother. So uh, we grew up in a small farming community in Western Oklahoma called Clinton, Oklahoma. And um, my father actually got into banking in the seventies and eighties during a save, during an oil and gas crisis. And he bought a bank out of receivership from the FDIC. It's just a, a farmer who'd gone to law school and was just trying to make it work. And so he, he, there was a bank that had failed in our local community and he, he bought it from the FDIC. They signed the contract on the hood of a, a Chevrolet pickup and he was, he was in the banking business. So that's, that's kind of the slant that of how our, how we, our family started um, towards banking. And then, you know, how Aaron and I got uh, involved together was um, I, you know, we both went to Baylor and Aaron's, Aaron's about 10 years older than me. And he, during the same, during the 2008 recession crisis, he bought a failed bank from the FDIC. He raised money uh, from investors here in Dallas and, um, and bought the bank that's called, that's called Triumph today. Um, so our journeys, our journeys kind of departed for a while. I, I went to work for JP Morgan and it was in New York and with my wife, who was also working at JP Morgan and covered consumer retail companies and then um, did a stint in, in private equity in Boston. But what, I had this passion to go do something entrepreneurial and it was around 2014 Instacart was just getting started. And so grocery delivery was like this really cool thing that people were talking about. And so, uh, you know, we used kind of that as inspiration. We started a company called Vacay Foods. It's actually the first thing we did together, uh, Brittany and I, and it was based in Northwest Florida and we were a grocery delivery 
startup out in uh, the vacation market called, called 30A. Like 14 million people visit that area every year. And our thesis was people buy people buy online for price selection and convenience. And when you're on your vacation, you're less price sensitive about your groceries. You care less about the selection. And you're more into the convenience of having it delivered versus like when you're at home. And at that time, you know, the grocery delivery wasn't a big chunk of the market. COVID hadn't hit and all those things. And it was such a great experience, Justin, in like um, learning to put constraints on your business model. I mean, we showed up and we were so young and full of energy and we're going to deliver same day. We're going to do all these things. We got refrigerated trucks. We actually had a, a, a couple of refrigerated trucks. And it is such an incredibly hard business to run. You know, you've got three different temperature zones. The average price point is like $3 an item. <laughs> You're trying to manage all these deliveries. And what we missed, you know, we just, we just learned so much, but the, the best thing that came out of that was it pushed me to learning how to write software um, because the problem had become too big to solve using just Excel and VBA macros, um, which we had from our banking days. And so I had to go figure out how to like, how do I stand up a database? How do I manage picking the orders? And it, and it all trans back from the customer. Like when is this customer going to be delivered and what have they ordered? And you have to filter all the way back to when you pick the order based on when you were going to deliver it and just all this complexity. And it was an amazing experience. Um, so after that, that summer, when I mean, we delivered a boatload of groceries and didn't make any money. Um, and my dad, so actually my dad got really sick. He had a, he had a cirrhosis of the liver from a, a medicine that he'd taken for his heart. And he was in the Cleveland clinic and needed a liver transplant. And so um, I was a match. And so I was, a, I went to, to Cleveland in the fall. We shut down Vacay Foods. And I was a living liver donor uh, for my dad. And so I spent about six months in Cleveland in the hospital just, to, you know, through the, do the donation process and the recovery process. And during that time, I just went all in on teaching myself how to, how to write, write software and actually sold a uh, first consulting project from a hospital bed in the Cleveland Clinic uh, to an equipment rental business down in Florida. So, and they wanted our routing software. They wanted the ability, you know, they were a bike rental and beach share company. And that's the super complex, like, when do you deliver the bikes? Where do you deliver the beach shares? There are two different locations. How do you pick things up? And it really pushed us into starting a, a IT consulting company called Cratevine. That was the only thing I could really do at the time was, you know, build software and sell projects to people. Um, I put on my dress shirt in the hospital bed when I did my yeah. Zoom call. <laughs> it wasn't Zoom back then. Um, but, and, um, and so after that, we moved, my family moved back to Dallas. So Brittany and I moved back to Dallas and we went all in on Cravebind. And it was such a great experience for me as a, as a founder, a future founder of a tech uh, startup is that I got so many at bats working with clients and customers. Hey, what is your product idea? And we helped them build it. And um, we had like a team of 30 people here in Dallas, very Ruby on Rails shop. That's, that's my passion is Ruby on Rails. And, you know, you just got so many at bats and hearing a founder tell you their idea helping you narrow the scope and build constraints around what they were trying to do so that you could actually deliver something, um, you know, that they could, that they could within their budget. And, and so it was just an amazing experience. And then at the end of that, about five years into that, my, my brother came to me, he ran, he, he was actually the CEO of Triumph Bank Corp here in Dallas. They, they've been growing it. They bought a factory business. They were doing incredibly well. And they had a product called Triumph Pay. And um, it was, it was an idea that they had to kind of flip the factory market around and build like a payments product for brokers. And they didn't have anybody to, to lead it or run it. And so they made me an offer to come uh, take over that product called Triumph Pay and, and grow it. And so it was, it was such a culture shock going from running my own IT consulting company with 30 people I'd hired, most of them I've trained myself um, to going into a publicly traded bank where my older brother was the CEO. And so it was, you know, Aaron, and I, Aaron, Aaron had to give me a lot of therapy sessions because there were times I'm like, what is this credit committee thing? And like, why, you know, why, you know, what are we doing here? Um, but ultimately Triumph was incredibly supportive and such a key component of my career and experience. And they gave me all the runway I wanted. They let me, you know, they let me run hard, mess things up. Um, and gave me all the budget that we needed to, to go tr grow Try and Pay really, really fast. And um, we grew Try and Pay from one broker and, and 50 million in payment volume uh, when I showed up um, and to about 15 billion in, in 500 brokers uh, when I left. So that was, it was, you know, as you talk about my parents and like my brother and how we related, why, why it made sense for us to, there was a time when you just, you could tell like, there was, there was a lot of pressure, you know, nepotism is a big deal in public and traded companies. And, um, you know, my brother's getting a lot of questions from analysts, you know, why is your younger brother running your highest growth 
thing and it's you know your most excited you know this is the thing that you're talking to the street about a lot and you know it, it just he and i have such respect for one another that we just were able to say like look like this has been a journey it's been awesome to do it together and it's a memory we'll always have and um and you know we hit i'd hit a target that they'd set out for me and um and we'd had an amazing team there and so it was just kind of a natural transition point for us as you know the bank becomes more focused on payments and try and pay and what that looks like it gives you know this, this it just provides clarity public public traded companies need clarity a lot of times on you know if there's hair on it if there's is, if there's hair on an issue it's like man your brother's in there what's going on um it just it just provided a lot of clarity and also just removed a lot of the, the stress from our relationship we got to just be brothers again and it's just fun to you know be brothers and, and not you know feel like you're talking to your boss when you're you're hanging out together um and um so it's it's been it's been awesome i love my brother he's been he's been an incredible mentor and influencer in my life and i'm so proud of what he's built with triumph and um i'm just so glad it's a part of my story so that is, that's it that's man i am glad i asked um that is okay so i've got about uh 15 things that i want to pull out i probably won't remember most of them and then i want to kind of move in move into the present obviously that was that's wonderful so really great <laughs> really great man thank you um so curious, uh, this may not matter to anybody, but you know, because it's my show, I get to do things selfishly and just ask questions. <laughs> How much does a bank cost in, in the 1970s or 80s that are signed? Like, what is it? Like, so, and the reason I ask this with like absolute curiosity is because um, it, being in Canada, uh, that's not something we can do here. You know, the, the regulations around banking, like I don't know this for most of our American listeners, and I assume most of our listeners are. Um, we have like basically six banks here. And that's not, that's not even a joke. There's some, like we're starting to, it's starting to loosen up, I think a little bit, but even all these banks that look like these kind of micro banks that you might see more commonly in the United States, I think they're just actually subs of the large banks anyway. They're all backed by the large right. banks. So they're kind of right. just brands basically more than they are banks themselves. So we have, it's a, it's a, it's not completely regulated, but it's, it's damn near close. So the concept of actually buying a bank is just not anything that even would ever come into a purview of someone who's kind of grown up in, you know, we're in Toronto. This is a pretty major financial market, right. globally speaking, but buying banks isn't something you do here. So what does that actually like? What does that look like? Yeah, without, without going into the, the complete history of the, the banking industry in, in the U.S., um, you know, banking is, is highly regulated in the U.S. And even flashing back to, you know, some of the financial recessions we had in the, in, in the U.S., a lot of that would, would stem from the, the you know, financial services industry or the, the banking industry. Typically prior to like 1970, like the 1970s, 1960s, banks, um, these community banks could form and they could have one bank in a, in a city and they could maybe have one branch. And so what that looked like is you had like a, a, just like this really fragmented banking industry across the United States. And there's pluses and minuses. The pluses was that there wasn't like a contagion effect if a large bank failed like if RBC failed in Canada, it would be detrimental to the financial, the capital markets in Canada. Whereas here, if you had a small bank fail, it, you know, it generally would impact a localized region. The FDIC would show up and they would take it in receivership to protect the depositors. They would take and take on some of the loans, the bad loans to reduce down the losses the bank was having and then resell and recapitalize the bank with new owners. And so that process, that receivership process um, really started to take off more after there was some deregulation and consolidation of these community banks, community banks started buying one another and they started consolidating and it created this trend where there was massive consolidation of, of the community bank in industry in the U S in the last 50 years. And, and that's still the trend. So what it looks like is <clears throat> the FDIC will start to identify that your bank is having issues and they start to get more involved in what's happening in your day to day. And there comes a point when they decide that the current managers and ownership are no longer able to maintain the liquidity of the bank or maintain the, maintain the capital of the bank. And so they show up on a Friday and they, they show up and the doors are locked. And this is in the seventies and eighties, right? It's a little different now, but like sure. they would show up and they lock the doors and they would have an auction and there'd be whoever's there has a chance to bid. Right. And to, to recapitalize the bank. And so whoever wins that afternoon signs and agrees. And it's a personal guarantee. Like it's a big deal. You're putting your, your personal guarantee at the key. I had to pledge some farms um, to do it. But you have until Monday morning at 8 a.m. They tell you the bank is opening Monday morning at 8 a.m. Anybody you're going to let go needs to know before Monday morning at 8 a.m. And any loans you don't want, any loans you want to try and put back to the FDIC, we need to know in the next 70, you know, 48 hours. And so it's a two all-nighters, just like 
okay, who are the managers that got us into this mess that need to be replaced? And imagine you're doing this in a small community where everybody knows everybody, right? Everyone goes to church together and eats together. So that's really fun and exciting. And the bad loans are people in the community. So, you know, it's, it's a very stressful personal huh. experience that he went through. So that's it. That's really, that's crazy. And so you, I love the idea that, you know, it shuts on, shuts on Friday and open up in, in some way. So there's all this sort of social ramification, but it's business as usual Monday morning at eight, right? The lights turn on and everyone shows up and you start making deposits and, and, and you know, in that time, you know, printing, uh, you know, printing, uh, you know, out outcomes on, on, what are they even called? Like banking books and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, so it's like, exactly. it's just business as usual Monday morning, new ownership, but no one knows it. And I love the idea of this, like, and, and I imagine now if they were, you know, if they, if they did stuff like that, it would just, there's just so much, um, visit, there's just so much visibility into everything in the world in general. So it's like, it'd be hard to pull off a, you know, a three man auction in a small little town anywhere at this point, but that's oh, yeah. a pretty cool point in time. And, and that, that's, that's, that's really great. Thanks for sharing that. And so, um, I want to talk about this grocery delivery in Florida. So you, you mentioned Brittany, I'm assuming that's your wife. Yeah, that's my wife. Yep. So you started a, a company with, with her, um, and doing grocery delivery, which yeah, is 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 famously very very challenging from a <laughs> from a profitability perspective. Um, and and so, how did you find how did you find that experience? Um, you know, you're doing a business with your wife because you kind of alluded to, it, and I and I asked this actually come from a personal note. Um, my wife and I are very uh, inter uh, intertwined in our businesses as well. Um, she's actually a customer of Rose Rocket, um, but oh, really? also I help her on her business. At, uh, uh, we have a lot, yeah, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of you know, uh, synergies there between, between us. So uh, a lot of transportation talk uh, around the uh, Bailey Myers household, um, probably, probably too much for, for most, but um, how did you guys, how, how did that, how did that go? You know, and so I, I get the, the it's, it's ro the idea is very romantic. Um, but again, coming from a personal perspective, it has its, it has its moments. How would you sort of looking back at that, you know, articulate the experience? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's not for everyone. Right. And I think that's really important that like, this isn't, um, it's not like if your marriage is really good, you should work together. Right. One of those deals. That's, it's not that. Right. So, so Brittany and I are basically clones of each other. Um, and so like we, um, it, it, you know, intellectually, like she is the, a brilliant, brilliant woman. She, she got her own job at JP Morgan and was is working in investment banking. She had her own career path track. Um, but, you know, there is some slight difference in our personalities. I like to be, you know, think strategically and like have new ideas and visions and pursue it. And and Brittany just loves to to be, you know, to be the executor that figures out, okay, this is what we're going to go do, how we how we're going to go do it. Um, and so there's a division of labor. So we don't we don't you know we don't have the same role, but there's a just so much trust and respect for one another. And um, and I think because we our relationship didn't start romantic. It started as friends in college. And then, you know, it, it, it changed. I think, you know, we had a basis for how we interact with one another when we weren't, you know, romantic or married. And so that that's really important. But I think the things I've learned, though, like you said, is um, you have to be more mindful not to bring work home and not be like, OK, let's talk about highway all day, every day. Let's talk about vacay foods all day, every day, because that's draining especially when you have kids, right? And like, you know, you, you got to be able to turn that off. And then also the, the nature of your communication style. For me, I explicitly work on changing that when we walk out of the office. So it's like when we're in the office, we have a, a tone and way we communicate to one another that I don't want to use when we're at home. And I don't want to bring home into here. I want there to be like some division so that, you know, um, for both of us and for her, like it, she doesn't feel like she's, you know, on and always has to be talking about work and, um, so the one thing that is challenging is she doesn't get to complain about work, you know, to me, she has to go complain to her friends. And so she loses that outlet a little bit. Um, but the power of, for us, like Brittany knowing, you know, sometimes I travel a lot for work. It was at times really hard with Triumph when, when I was at Triumph, she wasn't there, you know, for her to know where I was and who I was meeting with and, um, and all these things and just like, you know, the not knowing and not, you know, not knowing these people. And what was really cool when we did highway is she got to join back up. We got to do it together. And, um, and so when she came to the TIA, the first time I got to meet everyone and meet, you know, these people I talked about, like, um, Aaron Van Zeeland and Mike Riccio and Lynn Gravely and, um, these, these, these men and women who have been mentors in my life. I mean, it's just, she just, it was just a complete change for her to be like, oh, these are, you know, these are these awesome people. And, um, so yeah, it, you know, the, the, the last thing I would just say on it is like, 
it has to be the right time and place. And I think, you know, like it didn't work at Triumph because it was a public traded bank. There is the, what is the nepotism of my brother? And like, you know, it's, it's hard, right. It's hard to find that balance. Um, but what she is, what she's really gifted at is she's able to identify in situations when something's really not working and like vacay foods. There were times when we were just trying to, to, to Flintstone it or swivel chair, just like make it work. And she would just look at me and be like, this doesn't work, man. Like you've got to go figure out how we're going to optimize this with software or like, we're all going to lose our minds. Um, there's a really funny story about that, but, um, but she's also just an amazing, amazing person. Um, when we were starting VK Foods, we needed to price everything, right? Our website had to have the prices you buy in real time, add the cart. And so she literally, with a one-year-old, went and price checked like 5,000 items at Walmart. And they were like, this, these, these women would walk, the, the, the people that were working there, like the men and women, they came up to her, like two or three of them came up to her and be like, are you okay? Like, <laughs> they thought she was like, they thought she was like being, you know, I don't know. They're like, what are you doing? Why are you spending three hours at the Walmart looking at everything and not buying anything? Three and, hours? Uh, I think five, it sounds like it would take a lot more than that. That's like three hours did, a day for a week, probably. It, it did, it did, yeah. it did. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was, yeah, she's, 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 she's amazing. So it's been fun. There is great entrepreneurial spirit that is not only you know permeating from you just as an individual but it sounds like in these stories as well because i think that is the um that is the work that 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 so often has to be done but so rarely uh is is witnessed um you know how, how did this sort of behind the scenes you know you kind of said flintstone i've always you know described and and you know uh, as kind of a monkey balancing planes on a unicycle, right? It's kind of, it all looks super nice on the front end, but on the back, it's, it's, it's doing things that don't scale. It's a one-year-old on your hip price checking 5,000 items at, at Walmart. Um, and no one knows and yeah. no one sees, you know, and, 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 and it's, and it's funny because there's, there's real nobility and real, um, honor in that type of work but at the same time we're trying to hide it because we want everything to look completely exactly. modern and scalable and we've got all of our shit figured out so you don't actually want that you know to to to, to be seen but in, in so many ways it's actually the real it's the real beauty of of what's going on and i think in some ways that's almost like the secret you know people are like you know how did you do this because there people are often witnessing this like it's like oh i had an idea so that's step a Oh, and here you go, and here's my product, and I'm sort of at sort of step D. But there is, and just you know, to sh share with those out there who are thinking about starting a business or or wonder you know about how it's all done, it's the B and C that you rarely see that you didn't know existed, and that could be expressed in time uh, because it took three years that you didn't know existed between the idea and the actual execution of the idea. Uh, it could be in scanning prices. It could. It's all of the things that you do behind the scenes that that make it look. <laughs> figured out but got like you know newsflash here it's it's rarely is <laughs> it rarely is um that's that's great man i think let's let's use that as a nice segue into into highway so let's talk about what highway is and i think my question on that is why like why, why do we need this today yeah so i think right now there's a lack of identity and connection between brokers and their and their carrier networks and, you know, if you go to a broker and you talk to them, you know, you say, are you integrated with your best customers? And they say, yeah, absolutely. Our best customers, you got ADI integrations, we're all set up, we're, we're integrated and talking and connecting with them. And, and then you, you say, well, let's flip around, look at your carrier experience. Like, what does the carrier journey look like when a carrier wants to work with you? And, you know, it's, it's sometimes kind of, you know, jarring. You say, oh, you send them to a form, they fill out a bunch of information they've already filled out. You don't really know who's filling out that packet. Is it a dispatcher service? Is, who is it at the carrier? Um, how do you verify that, that, that digital footprint? And, you know, there's just, the, the, when you say there's that lack of connectivity, there's no integration, there's no like, you know, you have a lot of transactional carriers coming through. Brokers have, some brokers have spilt, spent, spent a lot of money building great portals for carriers to use, but they're not getting used because there's too much friction. The carrier doesn't want to remember a hundred username and passwords and how do I get back in it? And so you, you look at that and I'm saying, well, like, okay, we need to, to solve this problem we got to go to the beginning, to the beginning of the relationship. And, um, and we got to change that. We got to fundamentally change it from an onboarding one, from a broker onboarding a carrier to connecting with them. You know, onboarding is something you do with the vendor, right? Like this building onboards, the vendor that's going to come in and change the light bulbs. You know, that's not what we're trying to do for brokers and their carrier networks. We're trying to connect them. 
And, you know, this idea of highway, you know, so people have, are very familiar. We're signing with Google, signing with Facebook, and that's what we build. It's signing with highway where a carrier just clicks the sign with highway button on a broker's portal website. And they go through any qualification compliance, any of that kind of stuff that needs to happen one time. And then they're able to use that digital identity to get back into the broker's portal. So it's like, it's not just like a, a piecemeal solution of saying, okay, how do we onboard and qualify carriers? How do we develop the relationship and establish the framework of how we're going to continue to be, to be connected. So that's, that's, that's the essence of it. Signing with highway. It's like signing with Google for trucking. And, and do you see this as, is, does this lead to, um, because I, you know, I, I, I can't help but think, and I think a lot of, I think a lot of people who are sort of listening to you and have, you know, have heard your, your background, um, what, what I'm curious, like, how does this point to, so your, so your experiences that you've had have largely been, I mean, again, I, they're actually more, a little more wide ranging than I, than I had actually known before we, before we did this, uh, show, um, but there's, there's, is this, do you see this as like a, like a KYC almost for the carrier? Like, does this kind of have a, a, a sort of financial slant to it as you move along? Like, what is the, you know, I, I guess, and I sort of asked you this the first time we spoke and I don't know that I got, I got the right answer or, or at least one that I, I was looking for one, I guess, but like, <laughs> what is, so that's, that's great. Um, but I think your ambition far surpasses that as a product. So what is actually the, 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 what is the, the thing you're trying to solve at that higher level or what's the end point to this? And I'm, I don't want to ask you to give up any, uh, any, any trade secrets here, but you know, look, I'm, I'm a big believer in that, you know, as long as we're creating and we're not competing. So, you know, you may, may not follow that, uh, that belief system, but would really, I'm, I'm curious personally on, on where this goes from there. Cause it feels like a step, not an end point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's break it down into identity and connection. So, you know, carrier, uh, highway is uh, carrier identity and connection for three PLs and brokers. So in the identity piece, um, there's so much that we, we, there's so much excitement about what we can start to create um, around digital verification. You nailed it with KYC. I mean, that's deep in my background, right? Like JP Morgan and, and, uh, and, and triumph, like this idea of like KYC, know your customer. And what I think is fundamentally missing about the approach today is you use the same process for every carrier. And like, that's, you know, there's different processes, right? There's different levels of risk depending on the carrier profile. And so how can we tailor an experience that, you know, say is different for a new entrant who entered, you know, three months ago in the middle of a hot market has never been inspected. That carrier's experience for claiming their digital identity should look different then someone that's got 20 trucks, been in business 30 years, has a massive digital footprint um, and, you know, is very verifiable. And so we are absolutely going to Flintstone that um, in, in the beginning. Right. And like, OK, how can we in the background be churning in the background, developing manual process that eventually can be automated to start putting more behind the identity than just a DOT number? Um, and that's ultimately where we want to go is like um, is, is answer the question, who's really hauling your freight? And it's not just from a fraud perspective, right? Sometimes you get too caught up in like, okay, we're well, like putting all this pain and pressure on the carriers. It's also for the carrier's benefit. It's to secure the carrier's profile. As a carrier, I want to be able to say, here's my highway profile. You can't get in it. And the only person can get in it is me. It's protected by multi-factor authentication. It's, it's, it's protected by, you know, me verifying that I have ownership of this entity and who I am. And, and because carriers get hacked a lot, the, these, these you know, bad actors go after carriers because they're operating out of a Gmail, they're operating out of a Yahoo account, and they're reusing username and password and people are, and it's, it's a real thing. It's a real area where we want to help carriers. It's not just like, hey, how do we, you know, help brokers weed out bad actors on the carrier side? It's like, how do we protect a carrier that's put his livelihood into this business and his sweat and tears? I mean, I identify with that, with VK Foods, delivering the groceries myself is like, it would be, it would just be, it's, it's the fear that someone's going to take this from me because they steal my email account password. Like it, we got to give them more protection that their identity is more sacred and protected by someone that cares about that being secure for them than just like, okay, I filled out this packet and I entered a DOT number. No one verified who I was. I just did it. I can pretend to be anybody. That next step though. So now that if we, if we can get this identity right and we can answer the question, who's really hauling your freight? It's the beginning of the relationship. It's the beginning of the connection. That's the next part, the next phase. So can we take the existing systems of the carrier and bring those to bear at the beginning of the relationship? So, you know, just like when you sign in with Google 
to an app like Calendly. And Calendly says, hey, we want access to your Google Calendar to create events and do all these cool things. We want to be able to, when a carrier signs it with a broker, say, hey, and their TMS is connected and you can talk to them through, you know, capacity, tracking, onboarding, you can do all these communications of channels of communication through this TMS they're already using. So now you're talking about systems integration through this OAuth 2 protocol. And that can fundamentally change how brokers and carriers work and develop that trust in, through, through this integration. And that to me is like the exciting part is, can we use identity as a gateway to using a gateway to building relationships through connection? Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice, that, and that's, that's nice. And thanks for the, the uh, extrapolation of that. Cause I think that's actually really, uh, that, that's super compelling, I think. And I think there is, there is a need for that. Um, I, I can, I can clearly see why that makes sense. And I think, um, because, and I don't want to spend too much time on, uh, sort of on, on navel gazing in terms of what this could be in the future. Um, there's some obvious conclusions that come kind of after, 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 after even like, I like the sort of the, the long tail here is super interesting and there's multi directions you can probably go. And I think there's a really, um, yeah, I mean, I think you're, I think it's, it, this is, this is, a uh, this is a, it's, it's, it's well-timed, you know, I, I, well before Rose Rocket, you know, I, I tried to build a business, um, that uh, it was called friend shipping and it was actually what turned into today. It's, uh, it's flock freight actually. So they kind of did it yeah. you know, a decade later, but the idea for me originally was, um, consolidate LTL, turn them into truckloads, like everybody on a business park, uh, is shipping to the same places, uh, but they don't they don't communicate. They don't talk. Like you've got half a load to Charlotte, right. you've got half a load to Charlotte. Why can't we marry that together? The devil's in the details on that. The complexity around these types of things and the, and the constraints on that are incredible. And and I was young enough and naive enough to to kind of you know go far <laughs> with that. Um, but the reality was, the technology wasn't available. The mar you know it wasn't there for me. And you know being early and being wrong are the same thing. And so I think, you know, timing is, is so critical, obviously. And it feels like there is this, uh, I feel like over the last couple of years, there has been a, a step change in, I hate the word freight tech, but I'll use it. And, and I feel like where the products that have, that were startups, and I'll put Rose Rock sort of in that category, kind of in that like 2000, there was a lot of, I would say like the earlier startups in that like 2000 and like. 14 to 17 range is kind of when we got started are starting to mature now a bit more as companies. And, and so the, the, so these open ecosystems and the point solutions and the APIs, there's just so much more readiness and, avail and availability for that. Like this, this concept that, that you're working on this idea, as soon as you say it's a concept, this is a business, this business, um, it wouldn't have worked five years ago. Exactly. Yeah. But it, but it, it was needed five years ago, but you couldn't have done it. And so I think this is a, you know, it's, it's, it's well-timed in that it's, it's, it's always been needed. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like, as you're talking, I was like, I, I, I like, I thought we're headed to the same place. It's like, this absolutely would not have worked five years ago. Um, and, but today's market, you know, carriers are using more tools and systems to manage their business, even small carriers. It may, may or may not be a DMS, um, but they have tools and systems that they're using that they want to use. Uh, that they want to use and they should get to choose the tool they want to use. You know, people talk about app fatigue. You know, there's two solutions to app fatigue. One is there's one app to rule them all, which is not good for anybody, right? It's not good if there was like this, you know, one, you know, Amazon-like app that, you know, everything went through, right? Because then it puts all the power and all the data in one person's hands and that's not good for competition. So your only other option is to remove the friction, right? To remove yeah. the friction to let the person use the tool they want to use. They carry wants to use Rose Rocket. They're paying for it. They want to use Rose Rocket. They want all the data coming in there. They want to make all their decisions in there. They want to automate certain things. They want the rate confirmation not to come in an email. They want it to come in via API. It, they, they want that. And so let them choose that, but then remove the friction from them having to figure out how that connects with everything else. And so highway, so we say this a lot, highway is not a network. We are not a platform. And like we tell that to investors, like don't invest in this because you think it's a network or a platform because those buzzwords sound good um, in the VC markets. Like that's not who we are. We're a pipeline. And we're like the um, we're like the saber to to, to um, Expedia, right? So Expedia is the platform, the three PL is the platform in the network, and we're the thing connecting it to all the different systems of the carriers. And so that you can, so that to what we just said earlier, the three PL can create that seamless digital experience 
that, you know, there's all this Flintstoning that happened on the background that no one had to see, but the customer for the 3PL sees a digital clean, di clean digital experience and the carrier sees a clean digital experience. And so we're, I guess, I guess I can never get out of that, you know, Flintstoning, you know, that's, that's essentially no. what we are is we're working on wiring all that up. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's, that, that'll be some, uh, there'll be some block and tackling for the foreseeable future in order to get that, all that, all that going. Um, you, you know, you raised an interesting point, I think around, around app fatigue, and I don't pretend to know exactly what the right answer is answer there is but you know i'll say that it's it's something that so again going back for for us be, before rose rock we had a, a company called freight next which ultimately um it was sort of the genesis to rose rocket but you could but we i think we say that because it sounds better but it ultimately failed and 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 really what it was again it you know it was maybe a bit early but it was a you know we were trying to do um and there's lots of products that that do this now just tons that do it now but it was really expedia for freight specifically for ltl but even a layer down we were trying to unearth the carriers that weren't common carriers so the carriers that that the average shipper hadn't heard of so traditionally uh, carriers that would work with brokers so you haven't heard of this 120 truck ltl regional carrier before we're going to get them online but the challenge with that was we thought the opportunity was they don't have APIs. They're not hooked up to like a P44 or something. So you couldn't just resell basically these carriers. You had to actually work with them and wire them up and stuff. And and it, one of the the, the 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 great learnings from that business was, you know, we would send, literally a customer would enter an order. This kind of goes, you're Flintstoning me with the monkeys with the plates. They would enter an order, say so have, you know, one skid going from Dallas to, to, to LA and they'd put it in. And we would say searching for a rate. But what we were actually doing is sending a parsed email to the carrier and saying, here's the freight. Do you want to accept it? And like with a big green button being like, yes, like I'm, I'm literally talking like on your screen, be half the size of your screen because we kept having to try to optimize the carrier just to act on the email to accept the freight. And it didn't work because we couldn't get what I used to say is carrier. You can't get carriers to do something else. But really what I understand deeper now, understanding that the industry better is that the, the, there's only so many hours in the day. They're super busy working on exceptions and just, just like the actual, like, oh my God, like my driver is late. My driver's like all the things that actually matter in this like really, really hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of, 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 of business model that is trucking. And so asking them to, you know, accept this parsed email order from some random digital broker in 2011 was just like not going to happen. And so I, that was actually really for us was like, how do we, how do we think about this isn't going to work. So we've all, we've often said we had to get carriers onto the internet. That was like really the basic, really, you know, common language way to say that we have to create more automation and create. So for us, it was create a single source of truth that plays well with others to create the opportunity to engage in various types of products, activities, and business, um, but without having to, you know, swivel chair continuously. So, you know, I think we, we see the world the same way and that that's kind of, we went out to try, that's, that's what Rose Rock is trying to, trying to solve. I, I think we might say it differently now, but if I think about our, our lineage, that's, that's really what this started from was the, what we saw to be the, the, the emergence of, app fatigue per se. So yeah, that's, um, it's a, it's an interesting challenge that, that still seems to, to exist. And I think I, I caution startups. I don't, and I'm not saying this like as this, um, like loudspeaker through the show, but when I have conversations with startups, one of the things I'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk through that. If you're going to deliver a monolithic app to the driver, yeah, yeah. Like, be mindful. <laughs> be mindful. They don't. Want <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's. I think. <clears throat> like trucker tools, a great example. Yeah. Saad, what he's built, man. It, you know, you can't redo that, right? He's done it, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, you have to think about where you're at in the life cycle of technology and its adoption by the, the industry. Prasad has won that race, and it was there was a time and a place, and he moved when it was available to create the tool that carriers use to find parking and communicate and fuel and all these things. He built that and it's done and they're the one, right? You, you know, someone looking at that and say, I'm going to add a few features here sure. and then replace it. It's just like, that's not how this works guys. Yeah, you know, like yeah, the yeah. same way when I talk to guys, like just because you can build it in 2022 and you don't have to deal with all the things Prasad had to deal with in 2010 and evolve with doesn't mean you're going to get the switch. And Craig Fuller, 
one of my, you know, closest friends and, and man, he is a mentor. He's helped me so much. He's like, doesn't matter how great your product is. If you can't get people to, if you can't get acquisition, yeah. you won't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And that's, and you look at him, he's, he lives it out. That's why he built freight waves, right? He built freight waves to acquire as a channel for acquisition. So he controlled the channel of acquisition. It's brilliant. And like, like not enough people <laughs> celebrate Craig. I'm like, this is a freaking genius. You know, yeah. like his, his sonar, his, his low tender rejection index, that was genius. But then combining that with building freight waves in the, the voice of like this industry um, in a matter of years so that it just, it's beautiful, right? That makes so much sense. So yeah, just like the last thing, like, yeah, trying to change the behavior pattern of someone is so painful yeah. and that, and that's like, and I think in, in this in 2022, right? Like now it's not about changing behavior pattern. It's about what are they doing and how do we meet them where you are? Just like you said, and the beauty of like your email answer was like, that's what you were trying to do. It just 10 years ago, you know, like we fast forward 10 years. Now you, you brought people online. Rose Rock has been bringing people online. There's a lot of people bringing people online. Like you said, I love that analogy. And that's why I think like, this is the time for highway. We, you know, I mean, it just all it fits. I mean, you and I see it the same way. Yeah, man, that's a great, I, I'll make two quick comments and we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up and we let people know where we can, where we can find highway and get more information from one thing. I think, um, the, the genius of, of, of trucker tools, um, and this is not to under, uh, value the product itself, but the name is perfect. It's perfect. Yep. It's a, it's, it's it, when I saw that, I'm like, Oh, that is like so good. It is, it, it just, it appeals to the sensibility. Like I just, it's, it, it, you know, I'll let, I'll let people marinate on that because maybe it's, maybe it's obvious, but I think it's actually, there's, there's brilliance in that simplicity. So I love that. Um, and I also I agree fully with your, your assessment of, uh, of freight waves. And, and also we talked, we talked, we touched on it a few times in this, in this chat around timing. You know, I remember before freight waves came, even thinking like, like the alternatives at the time, I was like, this is, it's, it was so stuffy. It was so like non-progressive. And, you know, again, and here is little Rose Rocket in, you know, 2016 saying, where are we going to find people who want to buy shit like this? Like, because we had, you know, cause, <laughs> cause you would go to like, you know, and this isn't to, 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 to slag any of the, the sort of traditional stuff, but also again, going to, going to conferences that were running, you know, the same group, the same message, the same people for the last 40 years has a little company like us even get, get, you know, not laughed out of the room. So, you know, thank you to freight waves for opening the yeah. door for com companies like us as well. On top of this, Bloomberg thing they're doing and the, and the analytics and, and all the stuff. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I, you know, I think there's, I've got a lot of, um, gratitude towards freight waves yeah. opening the door for companies like us. Um, you know, and so we're, we're, we're grateful for that. Um, listen, man, that this was, this was really time, time well spent. And I hope it was as valuable for you as it was for me. Cause I had, a, I had an awesome time chatting with you. Where can we hear about, uh, where can people learn about highway? Yeah. I think, so it's gohighway.com. Uh, or they can always just email me at Jordan at Go Highway. And um, man, Justin, thank you for bringing me on here. I, it was an honor. I'm so excited about our, our relationship uh, and its growth and what Rose Rocket and you and I just getting to spend time together, man. I just, I, it's, it's, it's fun to see people with like-minded that are passionate about this industry. And, um, and honestly, dude, it's so cool how vulnerable you are about the things that didn't work right and i love that too like there's things i've done that haven't worked and i think that's good for other people to hear is like it doesn't always work and that's okay and i just i don't know i appreciate you being open and and sharing that in this time and um and letting the world hear that so thanks, thanks for man. having me man this is awesome yeah thanks for that and again we could do uh um if we had uh, hours upon hours i could pretty much spend an entire show on things that didn't work so uh <laughs> it's it's uh that's 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 the way it works we're, we're not uh Look, we're all human beings and we're, we're, we're highly, uh, you know, we're highly imperfect. So, um, look, man, thanks. Amen. Thanks for this. And thanks for going here with me. And, um, I, I'm looking forward to, to talking again soon. All right. Take care, Justin. Thank you for listening and be sure to like, and subscribe.